This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts, offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. Explore hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for a great vacation or a place to hold an event. ExploreAlex.com. Tri-State Brain and Spine Institute. With locations in Alexandria, Edina, Crookston, and Maple Grove. Doctors dedicated to evaluating and treating all types of brain and spine problems, no matter how complex. Page for Morris Fire. Repeat, this is a page for Morris Fire. I have a one-vehicle rollover about three miles west of Morris. One-vehicle rollover. Unknown injuries. Unknown if she's trapped. It was just a summer evening hanging out with friends. And I was fairly new at the time, so you know, the pager goes off, you kind of jump 20 feet in the air. Got in my vehicle, you know, ran down to the station, getting your gear on. We're in getting a truck, the whole bunch of us. And you know, my mentor was there and kind of just walking me through, okay, this is what we need to do. vehicle accident, no seat belt, there were people ejected and it was young, you know, high school age kids, so that doesn't make it any easier. Or I used to work out there, so I was familiar with the area. Then I was just there to kind of do what I was told, you know, help with patients, move people, so, you know, I'm holding on to this kid's head, keeping it stable. And that's what I did, I mean, and the one kid didn't make it. It's one of those things that sticks with you. There's a lot of those calls in the next 12 years, and you don't forget any of them, but that's the one that sticks with me. As long as there have been cities, there have been firefighters. Mats, blankets, and a line of neighbors passing buckets of water were the first fire departments. But huge fires in European cities led to a more organized approach to fire safety. In America, Benjamin Franklin is credited with organizing one of the first fire departments in 1736 and the first successful fire insurance company in 1752. As settlers moved west, most towns started with older technology and a sense of community. When there was a fire, everybody pitched in as best they could. In those early years, from the time that the first structures were being built, they were all of, of wood. And when they did develop some sidewalks, they built them out of wood. And of course, everyone heated with wood or coal. And all of those things, of course, were automatic formulas for if a fire did catch, it was gonna do a real good job on the structure. Cities really grew along the waterways. So everyone had a bucket. So if there was a fire, they'd grab their bucket, run down to the waterway, and they would line up. The person out at the water would put some water in the bucket and just pass it on. In fact, there was a fire in the 1890s uh, era where a third of the businesses on Main Street were actually destroyed. And after that, um, the city did develop an ordinance that there would be no more wood structures. The first organized fire department in Morris, Minnesota, was the Phoenix Fire Company, organized in 1880, just five years after the founding of the town. In those days, not only did the town have to worry about wooden structures and poorly designed chimneys, but there was also the ever-present danger of wildfires that threatened to overwhelm the small towns on the edge of the prairie. Wouldn't it be a good idea for the town council to have the fire break burned around the town? It is now the time to guard against prairie fires. If a fire should come from the northwest with all these high winds, the town couldn't be saved. Morris Sun. 
On Wednesday, while L.H. Pusher and family were in town, a prairie fire came along destroying his granary containing 1,000 bushels of oats. The prairie One fire south of town on Tuesday got into the beautiful grove of Chaz Nelson on the hill. And though he made superhuman efforts, assisted by the citizens to save them, yet a large portion was destroyed. Morris' son. Within a decade, the Phoenix Company proved inadequate. Although there were three separate fire squads, two pump engines, and a city-financed network of cisterns, attendance was often casual, responsibilities unclear. There was an alarm of fire last Monday, and only three of the fire company put in an appearance. What's the matter with our fire company that more of the members were not at hand? Perhaps it might be well for the council to investigate this matter. Morris Sun. In 1889, two devastating fires destroyed much of downtown Morris. Several city blocks and at least a dozen businesses disappeared overnight. And only the assistance of fire companies from as far away as Wilmer prevented an even greater tragedy. Finally, the town had had enough. Late in 1890, the Phoenix Fire Company was disbanded, and a new, smaller company was formed. These events reflect social and political changes taking place in towns like Morris all across Minnesota. But sort of the context for what goes on in Morris and other small towns like that at this point in time has to do with the Progressive Era and that, you know, this is a period of, of joining. The original New England settlers of Morris were being joined by new groups, Scandinavians, Germans, and Irish immigrants. These new members of the community brought their own politics as well. The Morris Tribune supported the then dominant Republican Party, while the Morris Sun generally favored the Democrats. But in 1890, the Sun and many Democrats threw in with the Alliance, the forerunner of the progressive farmer labor parties of the early 20th century. The chief engineer of the Phoenix Company, and one of the few who carried over to the new fire department, was Thomas Cullohan, a vigorous voice for labor. We want and demand a substantial reversal a complete overthrowing of the present system, and the establishing of a republic as an industrial solidarity. In all the glory of Jefferson's immortal inspiration, equal rights for all, special privileges for none. Labor demands justice and not charity. Thomas Callahan. In the 1890 election, the Alliance carried Stevens County, and many of the new members of the community assumed new positions of responsibility. The new Morris Fire Department became a significant experiment in a new cultural diversity. So Morris is an interesting place because it is much more ethnically, culturally diverse than other places in rural Minnesota. I suspect it's because it's a railroad town. The people that really dominate Atlantic Avenue early on, the merchants, they tend to be old stock Americans, the people that can date their ancestry back to the colonial period. And then you have an influx of Germans and Scandinavians who are, by the turn of the century, starting to have their presence felt. So a lot of the, the people that had, that had been incredibly successful, who had the most money, they're leaving, they're moving on, they're pushing on to greener pastures, and they're being replaced by these newcomers, tracing people that belong to the fire department in 1902. It's really incredibly democratic. Half of the folks were born in this country, whose parents were born in this country, but about six or seven of these guys are Irish. It's about three or four of them that are German and about four or five that are Scandinavian. It's a really interesting mix. The transition from the Phoenix to the new Morris Fire Department seems to have been an opportunity for talented members of the community to assume leadership roles they might not have occupied earlier. They're also, they're incredibly young. They're not so much store owners, but they're more tradesmen or craftsmen. So they're plumbers, carpenters, draymen. There's a fellow by the name of Thomas Callahan. He's an engineer, he's a former hotel proprietor, and he was perhaps recruited by the fire department because he had technical skills that would be useful for these guys. Callahan was the engineer the fire department needed, and like other new members of the community, used skills and contacts to move up in the social and business world. Some familiar Morris names begin appearing among these early firefighters. So there's a fellow by the name of Chris Yule. 
but he starts out as a as a drayman, which means that he's in the hauling business. But within a generation or two, they've established a hardware store. My sense is that if you would compare the firefighters to virtually any other civic organization in Morris at the time, it's going to be the most democratic of them of them all, in terms of religious groups, ethnic groups, and in terms of, of class. I mean, it's not just the rich guys. From these beginnings came the Morris Fire Department. For the last 125 years, the volunteers have made it their job to protect lives and property in Morris, Stevens County, and beyond. One side of the job involves keeping up with changing responsibilities and new training. In this sense, being a firefighter today has changed a great deal in the last century. But the other side of the job remains a lot like it must have been for Chris Duell and Thomas Callahan more than a century ago. Volunteer firefighters must find a way to do many jobs well. They must balance work and family responsibilities. But in addition, at the sound of a bell, a whistle, a phone call, a pager, or whatever technological alarm comes next, every firefighter has to be physically and mentally prepared to drop everything when the call comes. At the Minnesota Firefighters Museum, visitors can see some of the changes in equipment that have made firefighting more effective. This hand cart was actually carried by a couple of different people. They would, they would carry it on their shoulders and they would run to the fire and then there would be water in here. And then you'd have two people doing this back and forth. In the late 19th century, the Morris Fire Department owned several of these pumps. But during the first years of the 20th century, horse-drawn, steam-powered pumps had replaced them. When the call comes in, stoke up the uh, furnace here, and then you have another person at the top controlling the reins of the horses, so it's kind of like the driver. So by the time you got to the fire, you'd have this big black smoke coming out. Gasoline-powered engines were the next big step. The Morris firefighters still own and maintain one of their earliest fire engines, a classic Studebaker that saw service from 1929 to the late 1960s. Here's they were loading the old Studebaker up to go to Bemidji to bid for a fire convention. Yep. They put it in the parade at Bemidji because they had their annual fire days and, and the guys had a couple of kegs of beer in the back and they were handing out <laughs> free beer. That's how we got <laughs> that's how we got voted in for the annual <laughs> fireman's convention. Okay, now I gotta see this picture. <laughs> right there. The last fire for the Studebaker was one of Morris's biggest, the nineteen sixty seven Armory Fire. It was a lovely, lovely building where all community events and many large county and regional events took place. And you look at the newspapers of that era and the architectural drawings, it really was quite spectacular. So when we got there, the upstairs was on fire and the fire trucks were in the fire hall. It was a cold, frosty January 1967. Um, it had happened in the middle of the night, so when you saw it early in the morning. There were great icicles hanging from all of the window ledges and the beams that had been um, destroyed, and it was basically just uh, a shell. I think we uh, fought that fire for 24 hours straight. I don't know if we'd have had the equipment we have today, uh, we may be being able to put the fire out. Over time, protective gear and equipment has improved as well. The gear they have now is has been updated and, and stuff to better gear, better air packs, uh, better equipment, like some of the trucks that, that, that we had here when, when I started, you know, were, were old, they were limited. We've got much more equipment now that makes it a lot easier on us. The breathing apparatus that we have is excellent. The warning devices that our air is running out is excellent. We got infrared cameras where we can scan the areas to find these people if they are in a house. We've been blessed with great equipment here in Morse and so everything has changed. The, the radios, the communications between firemen and truck, uh, between firemen and firemen, it's, it's a world of difference. Responsibilities and training have changed as well. It wasn't that many years ago, 25, 30, 40 years ago, where you, when you joined a small volunteer fire department, you just got on the truck, you were issued some gear, you went along and, and the older, more seasoned firefighters said, just, you know, follow me, I'll tell you what to do. Back then there was schools to go to, but it was uh, not training like they have today. 
we'd go to the cities to uh, fire school for three days and go to classes, and after that they'd turn you loose, and that was the end of your training. But even as training and equipment have improved, new challenges have emerged. Firefighting today is more complex and challenging than ever before. When a lot of the old line firefighters, maybe that started in the 50s and 60s, your furniture was made out of wood. Today it's made out of different fabrics that uh, can burn in an instant and give off, give off toxic gases. You have to be knowledgeable of what if something happens. Chemical spills, you know, is a big thing. I mean, there's just so many different things that the fire department is going to be required to do, you know, if something bad happens. Today's training encompasses not only firefighting, but it encompasses EMS becoming the EMT. It also entails all, uh, all firefighters becoming what they refer to as hazardous materials technicians, actually dealing with uh, uh, a hazardous situation, how to move those bottles safely. So that's now all, all incorporated in the basic training. And with all the new responsibilities, firefighters are busier than ever. Last year was a very busy year for us. I think we had 105 incidents, rescue, fire, uh, hazmat incidents, high level rescue, search and rescue for people. The calls just kept on coming and coming and coming. For all the changes in the last 125 years, much remains the same. Today's Morris Fire Department depends on the skills and teamwork of its members, just as it did in 1890. It was intriguing you know, because um, the fire station would always be empty, it would always be quiet, you know, until that whistle blew or that pager went off. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was this action, you know, the fire trucks would, would head out of the department and then back in that day, um, you could actually ride on the back of the fire truck, you know, so you'd see the fire trucks leaving the station and there'd be three or four guys actually hanging on the back of the tailboard. All of a sudden they were just common people running down to the fire station, putting on their gear and jumping in the trucks and on the trucks and, and going to the fire and, and having the ability, you know, to put the fire out or the rescue call or whatever it might be. So those, that was, those things were kind of intriguing. They had a meeting above the old armory and three of us guys got sent downstairs and they needed two guys out of the three and I was lucky enough to get picked to be on the fire department. Well, I was a young guy, eager, ready to go to work, and uh, just wanted to be on the fire department. The boys had a meeting, and they come and said, uh, you're supposed to come to the next fire meeting. I said, what for? Well, you're going to be a fireman. I guess, you know, I'd always thought that I would be someday. I guess I didn't know when. My father was a firefighter. You, you hear the stories of the, the longevity of these people that get on the fire service and how long they stay and uh, just a friendship that's developed. And I think, yeah, I, I can see myself being part of that. Two friends of mine, Doug Stork and Jeff Miller, were both current firemen. Uh, we were just talking one day and they were telling me how much fun they had, um, what a great time it was, helping people. And I was looking for something to kind of help put back into the community, so I decided to join. The work of a firefighter can be dangerous, but firefighters in Morris have built lasting friendships from their shared experiences. And we always had a banquet and a tremendous meal. It was always homemade mashed potatoes and gravy and turkey and, and you name it. It was the annual deal. The fire department was pretty close-knit. We used to have all matching suits. Everybody had a suit coat and pants and a tie and usually we wore them at all the functions. and. I hated those. Oh, nights. I did too. Yeah. They looked like you were sleeping. I mean, they should have been pajamas. Well, I've had a lot of good times here, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of the uh, parties we have for retirements and sweethearts banquets, and, and even getting together to work for the steak fry and pancake feed is a good time. We are here with your, all your friends. Sometimes things don't go exactly as planned. It was uh, in the winter and the parking lot was just uh, really slippery, really icy and everything. This one firefighter, he was on the hose by himself and uh, normally you have a couple of guys on there but he was on the end of the hose by itself and he said, charge the line, charge the line, you know, well they charged the line and he was standing on this ice and when the water got to the end of the hose it was probably a little more pressure than it should and the firefighter was hanging onto the hose and he went to the right like this and then he went back to the left like this so it was like a wild garden hose he went back and forth a couple three times before they shut the, <laughs> before they shut the water down but no amount of training or equipment can prepare a firefighter for what can happen in the worst moments 
car accidents are, are, you know, they're terrible. They're probably the hardest thing on it is car accidents because we know most of the people, you know. There's the chances of knowing somebody in a car accident in Stevens County is somebody in the fire department's going to know them, you know. We get, we get called to a lot of rescue calls and uh, because we're, most volunteer fire departments are your neighbor and uh, probably the hardest part of going to, especially a rescue call, whether it's a farm accident or a car collision or something like that and, and knowing the people, um, you know, that are hurt or trapped or something and, um, and that didn't survive. and. Um, you know, coming back with that and, and bringing that back home, I think that's, that's that's probably the hardest part of the job. You don't prepare, you, you just numb. You numb up, you know, you know, uh oh And you go, you got, I gotta go. Somebody's gotta do it. One of the hardest things about this job of being involved with EMS, Fire Department Ambulance, is that you've seen a lot of different things and you know what can happen. So if my wife is not home within five minutes when I think she'll be home, I'm scared. I'm thinking, when is the pager gonna go off? When am I gonna get that phone call? Um, or when my kids don't come home when they're supposed to. All you can think of is what you've seen and what you've done. And that's, that was probably more one of the harder things that I had to deal with. We think the worst. My brother has commented that he's seen a change in me from what I used to be. It does change you, you cannot not affect you. I'm, I'm, I'm a much more emotional person than what I used to be. Very, I'm um, very emotional. Things get to me, okay? I can cry at the drop of a hat. <laughs>
But additionally, by including a true cross-section of the people it serves, the rural, volunteer fire department embodies the cooperation that defines the American small town. To me, it's knowing that, that you're there to help somebody in their moment of crisis. But the rewarding thing is what it does here. Knowing that you made a difference in, in saving somebody's property, uh, helping them in, in a car accident or whatever it might be, uh, that's where you get paid. I, and I firmly believe that's what all these guys do it for. It's not the money, because the money is little or nothing. It's the feeling that you give of giving back to your community and being part of the community. Just being a new group of friends, you know, being a part of that brotherhood, being part of something more than just yourself. This was a way for me to get involved with my community. Um, I didn't realize it when I first started, but I've learned this as, as over the years that I've been here, that if you really want to get connected with your community, join the local ambulance service, join the fire department. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts, offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. Explore hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for a great vacation or a place to hold an event. ExploreAlex.com. Tri-State Brain and Spine Institute. With locations in Alexandria, Edina, Crookston, and Maple Grove. Doctors dedicated to evaluating and treating all types of brain and spine problems, no matter how complex.